What's up, everybody? I'm Mike Berlani, watching Wild Fed Family. And right now we are in between the splits of the duck season. The deer hunting has been a little bit slow. So what I'm gonna do is spend the whole day, whole day hanging out at the smoker. And what I'm gonna show you is how to use probably what I think is the most underutilized cut of the deer. And that is the venison shank. And not only just the shank, but more specifically the front shank. This piece of meat is absolutely packed with sinews, tendons, um, has low meat yield. You can go ahead and debone it and cut the meat out, put it in the grinder, but I don't like to do that because all of the sinews, tendons tend to clog up the grinder unless you've got something really heavy duty. So instead, I'm gonna show you how to use that stuff at your advantage and pack a bunch of flavor into a really great meal. And you can use this for a multitude of things and I'm gonna show you what I'm using it for today. But before we do any of that, I gotta take you back a couple days and I will meet you up at the kitchen. All right, so the first step is gonna be going ahead and get some shanks out of the freezer. So let me uh, shuffle through all this and see what I can find. So I got my shanks pulled out and what I'm gonna do is put them in the fridge for, I don't know, a day or two, let them slowly thaw out and uh, I'll see you back in a day or two. Well, here I am in the kitchen, and I actually told you that it's going to take a couple days for this to thaw, but I got pretty impatient, and what I did was I took these bags and I put them in the sous vide cooker, and I, I ran it at about 90 degrees for 30 minutes, so that's a little cooking tip. If you want to get things thawed quick, just if you have a sous vide, put it in there, thaw it out. So, these are completely thawed, and this is super simple. I have basically four ingredients, um, and I have two cups of culture salt. I have two cups of brown sugar and I have two and a half tablespoons of Prague powder number one. It's basically just the pink curing salt. And there it is right there. Um, I also have some ice on standby and right behind me, I got a pot of water. It's, it's two quarts of water that's boiling right now and I'm about to pull it off and we're gonna make a brine for this. And the brine is super easy. Let me turn that stove off. Um, like I said, just combine your ingredients. So two cups of salt, two cups of brown sugar, your two and a half tablespoons of your curing salt, and uh, one more ingredient I forgot to mention. Um, I got some bay leaves over here. I'm just go ahead and throw those bay leaves in. Got a couple stragglers and while this water's hot you just stir it around and let it dissolve and uh, once this is completely dissolved like I said I got that ice on standby um, I'm gonna chill it down while it's sitting right there um, cold water I got four quarts of cold water Go ahead and dump this on. It's just about covered up. Give this another stir. So that took just slightly longer than I expected to dissolve, but we're there now. Um, so with your hot brine, go ahead and cool it down. Add some ice, stir it in, and let that ice completely melt to the point where, where you, when you pour this, concentrated brine in your mixture, you're not gonna end up cooking the meat. Let's get it close. All right, all the ice is completely melted and I can stick my finger in it without getting burned. I'm just going to pour it in here. And that's about what you're looking for. You want your meat to be completely submerged. Um, all the shanks are completely submerged. These neck bones that I threw in here um, didn't quite make it all the way. But what I'm going to do is just go ahead and rotate it once, maybe even twice a day. And this is it. Uh, so. Once you get to this point, um, I don't. It, it doesn't matter what you use. You can use, you know, a big 
Tupperware like this. Uh, you can use a pot, you can use a five gallon bucket. It doesn't matter, whatever fits in your fridge. Uh, you know, Ziploc bags. And I'm just gonna put a lid on this. I actually got the walk-in cooler running right now. Um, I have a bunch of dog food that's in there from the trimmings from the deer that I've processed and uh, some of the other videos. But anyway, put a lid on this. I'll stick it in the walk-in cooler. And right now it is Tuesday and I plan on smoking it on Saturday. So that'll give me four days, um, four days of brine time. And in order to speed the process up, what I like to do is go ahead and run an injector and on these shanks, because they have some of this uh, sinew and silver skin, I just go ahead and shoot some of that brine closer to the bone. And that allows it to penetrate much easier. Um, there's been a couple times where I, uh, I made some hams, which is a larger piece of meat, but the brine did not penetrate nearly as well all the way into the bone. Um, and I had a little bit of uncured pork left around the bone. So I don't want that to happen. And um, regardless, it's gonna, it's gonna cut your brine time, I don't know, down by about 30% is what I found. So, a couple shots in there. Almost done. These smaller shanks won't take nearly as much. Give it a good little shot. And the next, I really don't have to do any of this too because there's really not any meat to inject. Um, I've cut all the meat away and there's no silver skin that I'm really worried about it having to penetrate. So, that's about it. Meat's injected. I'll throw a cover on this, put it in the cooler, and I'll see you on Saturday. So let me show you this smoker so you have a decent understanding of what I'm talking about. And before you say anything, yes, I know it looks like an outhouse, but it's not. I have a full swing door on here on the inside. See it? Ceiling is probably about six feet tall. And it's set on a three by three pad. And I have a piece of old gutter, heavy gauge gutter that comes up through that pad that this outhouse is sitting on. On the outside of the door here, I have just a simple barbecue thermometer that I'll be monitoring the temperature through. And all of the smoke is able to vent through the high ribs on the roof. And you'll see what that looks like. Now you're probably wondering where the smoke and the heater is going to come from. And I'm actually standing on it. I have a steel plate that's up underneath my feet with a pit in the ground. So let me get that uncovered and I'll show you what it looks like. So I got my pit uncovered and it's basically concrete walls with a dirt floor and it's about two by two. And up in there, you can see that is the other end of that gutter. So up underneath the ground from here into the floor of the smokehouse is where all the heat and the smoke is going. And the reason I did that is so that if I want cold smoke, I can keep the temperature down that smoke is going to cool while it goes up underneath the ground, comes up through the floor, and it's not going to cook the meat that I'm hanging in the smokehouse. But today we're not going to do that, and I'm going to show you something a little different. So now that we got it cleaned out, ready to go, as you can see off to my left, I have a stack of hickory. So I'm going to go ahead and pile that up, pile it in, and get this fire ripping hot. Now if you're looking at this, you're probably thinking, this guy has no idea how to start a fire, but let me show you a little trick. This right here is called fossil fuels. I'm gonna take advantage of it. Let's get the same ripping. Now the main reason I did that was one, it was fun. Secondly, the wood was a little damp. It rained about two days ago, so it helped speed things up. You coming to check out the action? Yeah? 
Now I'm gonna let this burn down for about an hour and while it's doing that, let's go to the kitchen and prep the meat for the smoker. So here we are four days later and this is what it looks like. Um, so I actually have some neck bones that I put in there as well just because why not? Um, so as you can see, the meat is like a dark red and that's that cure working on it. So I wanna keep these salty. So what I'm gonna do is just give it a light rinse in the sink. Um, typically if you're doing a ham or corned beef, you're gonna to wanna to let this sit in some fresh water for an hour to three hours and let some of that salt seep out. But that's not what I'm gonna do with this because this is gonna contain most of the salt content for the dish that we're gonna make and the dish is that you can potentially make with this. So all I've done here is taken these shanks out of the brine, rinsed them in cool water in the sink, and I put them on just a layer of paper towels, patted it dry. You want these to be semi-dry and a little bit tacky. You don't want to put the wet meat in the smoker because then the smoke is not going to stick and the flavor is not going to adhere as nearly as well. Now all of this have been sitting on the counter for probably about an hour while the fire has been burning down and it's semi-tacky pretty much dry so what i did was i put some meat hooks on it um, and i'm just gonna bring this down to the smoker we're gonna hang it up and we'll get to smoking some meat now the meat is hanging in the smokehouse and it is very important that you leave air gaps in between all of this so that you get good air circulation around that piece of meat so I'm going to go back on the back side, change up the airflow a little bit, and let's get some smoke rolling through this house. Now you can see here I have about six inches of coal bed, so I'm just going to go ahead and knock a bunch of this stuff down. It's super hot, and that is going to burn for a long time. Now it's important when you're smoking anything to let it burn down to coals. You're still going to get the smoke, you're going to get the flavor, but what you're not going to get is dirty smoke. And that's really just the excess carbon and moisture um, that's coming off that wood, but in turn it makes your meat taste bitter and just not really good so burn everything down to coals when you smoke stuff and you're going to be much happier with the end result so all i'm going to do now is flip this steel plate over i'll try not to burn my face off while i do it and we're going to cut off the airflow and that's going to redirect the air up into the smokehouse and for extra measure all this dirt that i scooped away i'm going to push back over the edge and that's going to create a seal along the steel plate so that smoke goes that way and not this way. This right here is exactly what we want to see. All that smoke is coming up through the bottom of the smokehouse, going up to the meat. So all I gotta do now is close the door, let her smoke. And I forgot to mention, 175 to 200 degrees is what you're shooting for. And just give it a long, slow smoke. And for all of you advanced smokers out there, you're probably wondering, wait, how does he control the airflow? Well, I'm about to show you. And let me know if you have a better option in the comments. Um, I've been you know, kind of thinking about a couple different things, but I haven't really set my mind on it. And let me know what you think. But right now, what I do is I just have a one inch steel pipe that goes down in the hole and every time the temperature drops I'll just go ahead and hook up a little cordless blower to it get some air in there and get the temperature in the smokehouse back up. Now I do understand that a lot of people do not have access to a smoker like this or have not built one at their place yet but that's fine because you can do this on a offset smoker you can do this on a pellet smoker shoot if you got a Weber kettle go ahead and do it on that and indirect heat or even a gas grill go ahead get you a little uh, smoke pan fill it with some wood chips put it in there tin foil uh, does not matter so just because you don't have this does not mean that you cannot make this recipe
here we are about six hours later and I'm not really concerned about the internal temperature because it's been holding at 175 to 200 for so long that most likely the internal temp is going to be right around 150. So that's kind of what you're shooting for if you are going to be using a probe. What I'm more concerned about is the color and I want that deep red, you know, smoky looking flavor on the outside and I don't know, let's go check it out and kind of see what we're working with. And the reason that I say that is because the way that you're gonna use this piece of meat, it's gonna get stewed down and add flavor to a slow cooked meal anyway. So what you want is the flavor, it's gonna get cooked. And when I go ahead and pull it all out, it's gonna get vacuum sealed, stuffed in the freezer for future use anyway. This right here is the moment of truth. I'm gonna pop this door open and we'll see what it looks like. And you're gonna be here with me for it. Now this right here is exactly what you're looking for. Deep red color, all the way cooked through, smoky, and it's ready for the next meal. So I'm gonna take these up to the house, let them cool, and let's get started. Now you're probably thinking, what the heck is this guy gonna do with these silver skin covered, sinew packed, tendon packed pieces of smoky, dry, salty meat? Well, I gotta run an errand and it's about 100 yards away. So come on with me, it will make something great. I'm going to get the rest of the ingredients, but for those of you that don't know this, I grew up in upstate New York. And right now I live in the very dead center of Georgia in the deep south. So there's a lot of things culturally that I, had, that I had to get used to, one of which was the food. There's two things really that caught my attention. One was boiled peanuts. Now I will take a boiled peanut, especially with the Cajun seasoning, over a regular peanut any day. The second one was collard greens. I had never even heard of them. And to be honest, they're probably one of my favorite things to eat. And I actually grow them eight months of the year. I grow them in the spring, I grow them in the fall, and right now it's fall and this is the best time to grow them. So I'm going exactly to my collard green patch and we're going to pick a bunch of vegetables and we're going to get to cooking. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. Here they are, this is my fall garden. I got celery, I got collard greens, I got cabbage, broccoli, lettuce, all that, but you don't care about it because right now we're picking that and we're going to make some dinner. hard to film and carry this amount of vegetables at the same time but quick gardening tip if you live up north you can do the same exact thing with broccoli leaves if you're growing it um, go ahead and follow the same exact instructions that I'm about to show you so here's the deal not only am I gonna show you the venison chink recipe but I'm also gonna show you how to use it to make my collard green recipe so what I got here is about <clears throat> a pound of pork fat and I'm not going to use all of it I'm going to use about half a pound I'm going to throw it in a hot, hot pot and let it all render out oops and maybe you don't have this amount of pork fat readily available you can definitely use olive oil but sometimes I like to be a little bit extra and this is what I'm doing now that all the pork fat is rendered I went ahead and I cut the shank in half because it's not going to fit in the pot. And you can see the inside, completely red all the way around. The brine is completely soaked through. And what we're going to do is put this in the pot with pork fat, let it brown, and I'll show you what's next. Well, I'm an idiot and I had my video mode in the wrong setting. So basically what I did was I added two quarts of homemade venison stock. And I put that lid on, we're gonna let it simmer for about an hour or two. And while that's simmering, I have a massive pile of collard greens that I need to get stemmed out. So I'm gonna go ahead, run my knife right along it, get the leaves off, that's the stem, that's it. 
I got a big pile to work on. I'll speed this up for you. So right here, I have all of the greens. Right here, I have all of the stems and I have all of the trimmings. And the nice thing about growing your own stuff is you're in control of all of it. So typically, I soak this stuff in vinegar and salt water for, for about 20 minutes, rinse it all off, but I don't need to do that right now because last night and the two nights before, we had a frost and I also had a rain come in about an hour before I picked this. And yes, I know that you're not supposed to pick vegetables right after it rains sue me sorry but this is what we got so i'm going to go ahead and dice and slice all of this throw that in the compost and toss it in the pot the pot has been simmering for about an hour so I'm gonna take all of these grains, stuff as many as I can in there, and yeah, that's about it. So I packed it to the brim, and all of this is going to wilt a little bit. So while it wilted down just a touch, I'm gonna to add two Vidalia onions, and I have on a plate, I would say, I don't know, a tablespoon of garlic powder, two teaspoons of black pepper and two teaspoons of crushed red pepper. I don't measure anything. So I think it looks good. We're gonna add it to the pot and then we're gonna add more collards. Let that simmer for about two hours, then you're good to eat. And don't forget a splash of vinegar. That's it. So I'm gonna go ahead and save you the mouth-watering and excruciating pain of you watching me eat this. Could it, Cause it is so good. And it's probably the only thing that I'm gonna eat for dinner. But check out these new boots. Aren't that cool? Let's eat, baby. Now you may think that all of this is a little bit overboard and cinematic, but what I want to tell you is that you would pay so much money going out and getting this kind of food at a restaurant. Matter of fact, uh, a couple years ago, my wife and I went on our anniversary dinner and I paid $60 for a piece of elk backstrap, $60. And you know what? That elk backstrap was not even organic it was raised on a farm because the federal government doesn't allow you to do that so what you are able to do is you're able to go to the woods you're able to get your food and it's gonna be as organic and good as it gets all I'm saying is go out harvest your own food and take care of it and I know it may seem a little bit overboard for the first video but what I'm trying to show you is that you can make gourmet food from the woods and I got nothing against going ahead and putting a piece of backstrap over a fire while you're out there camping with your buddies but it can be really good you can have people over serve them a plate and they'll have no idea it's venison and it's it's not that you don't want them to know it's venison or make it taste like something else but you want it to be super high quality and high quality is exactly what it is so go out harvest hunt thrive feed your family and if you like this kind of content, let me know. Like, share, subscribe, tell your friends about it. Um, get together in the kitchen and have some fun. But until then, I'm going to see you on the next one.